have the honor today of introducing um, Scott Hunsaker, and um, I'd like to read a short bio and then turn the, the time over. Dr. Scott Hunsaker is a distinguished associate professor of honors education from the School of Teacher Education and Leader Leadership in the Emma Eccles Jones College of Education and Human Services. Dr. Hunsaker has been recognized by his college and its with its Teacher of the Year Award, its Outstanding Undergraduate Research Mentor Award, and the Carol and Bill Strong Human Service Award. He has been at Utah State University for 20 years, teaching primarily in the areas of educational foundations and gifted and talented education. Please help me welcome Dr. Hansaker. Make sure I get my microphone on. Thank you all for, um, this is the first time I've participated in this conference and I've been very impressed already and, and look forward to the opportunity to share some of my experience with teaching here at Utah State University. The course I'm going to share from is my LED 4150 course, Assessment and Differentiation in the Curriculum, across the curriculum, which is a course required of all our students to take, so I see about 120 students to, 100, uh, to 180 students a year. Um, I've had as many as 90 in the class, broadcast all over, and uh, as, as few as 70 is about the lowest enrollment we've had in that. For our department, that's unusual because we set a standard years ago that we believe that class size made a difference, and we're committed to making sure our class sizes were never more than 30. But when it became evident that um, we needed this particular course, uh, as well as a course on classroom management that all our students need to take, um, we had to come up with other ways of going through, so we've, we've broken our own rule. We're going to be looking then at active and passive learners permitting student choice. This is, uh, has been an interesting odyssey for me that is continuing, and I'll talk about that as we go through, to, uh, go through today. You've already heard that active learning contributes to um, student retention. But when we look at the work of uh, Rita, who has done the major work on quiet students in the classroom, and when I Googled this, I Googled things like quiet students, student silence, passive learners, and so on. Professors have a whole vocabulary for explaining student silence. They're unprepared, resistant, hostile, less intelligent, or absent. In other words, the talk among professors about the students who are non-participating tends to be fairly negative. We have a negative view about those students. Many years ago, when I was in my PhD program, we were, taking, we were doing a class on social-emotional issues related to the gifted and talented learners. And one of the students in the class was herself a very shy person and chose to look at shy individuals who are gifted. And it first sensitized me to the idea that maybe being shy doesn't mean being a poor learner. Maybe not choosing, to, choosing not to participate in class doesn't mean that you are not learning. And so on. So this is where this, this whole thing first came, for me, uh, came to me. And then um, work has gone on since then. There's a new book out, in fact, just um, this year, I think it is by CASE, C-A-S-E, that deals with uh, much the same issue. And if you want, email me and I'll look back up the reference. But Rita's work is, is the most important. She's got, I've, I've listed the title of the book here, Between Speaking and Silence, but the quotes I have are from her recent um, Chronicle of Higher Education um, article. So the research that Rita has done, student silent isn't necessarily a problem. Some students choose silence because it best fits their learning style, culture, or history. Silence can invite meditation, contemplation, and engagement. In other words, silence, along with dialogue, fosters learning. If you Google, for example, the silent movement in college teaching, there's actually a whole movement called the silent movement, where the whole idea is, in fact, Let's stop always having discussion and give time for students just to sit and think as one way of doing active learning. 
some students choose to remain silent because of their own learning style, rather than being led by other motivations such as anxiety of perception by peers or professors. What this study by o Obenland, Munson, and um, Hutchinson is showing is that silent students, in fact, are primarily engaged in the learning. They are, not, they are not disengaged, they are not apathetic, but they are actually engaging. If the learning environment itself encourages participation and benefits with both silent and vocal students with even, even within a large class. So if you've got an active learning environment and students not participating in that actively through making comments and so on, they are still being active intellectually. So the, 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 the onus is still on us to provide the active learning environment. That doesn't mean that the students then are going to necessarily all, have to all participate in order to gain from the class. Now over the years I have received, well let me, let me go so. So I've got, given this, and this is actually, as I was doing the research to, uh, and, and doing the Google searching to prepare this particular situ this situation, I thought, you know, something's wrong with my title from the very beginning. I, this, I, I proposed this, you know, last spring, and as I'm working during the summer to prepare this, working during this week, I say, something is wrong here with, this, with the title of my presentation itself. Take a few minutes just to think, look at this, and tell me what's wrong here. So just think for a couple of minutes. Given the research that I've just shared with you, your own experience, other things that you may have read, what's wrong with my title? Yes? So, so, so when you say a gradient, that this active and passive continues, is, is on a dichotomy, depending on, not a dichotomy, but, yeah, well, not a dichotomy, but on a spectrum, that, that, that we all tend to move, uh, depending on what's going on within that, yes? I think that's part of what's, that, that's part of what's wrong with this title. Sir, right here in the red tie. That's right. So the research I just showed you said these quiet people who, I, who, who when I wrote this title I was thinking of as passive may in fact be engaged and be thinking about the material and actually learning. Anyone else? Yes? There might, be, there might be some personal factors going on in how they make those choices. And one of the things that one of the quotes, if it's even a choice, because it just might be the way they are. It's a personality, personality issue. Thank you. Right. Yeah, Any, anyone else? Kit? So, I mean, there, there are a lot of things here that make some implications about my beliefs about who I am as a teacher and the, who the students are as learners. And I am making a judgment about students when I assume that when they are quiet, they are being passive or disengaged. And it's up to me to permit them to have a choice um, about, you know, that's, I'm, I'm the authority figure. So it's not about who they are, it's about who I am. Yeah. Any other final comments? Sylvia? You call them learners. So they're probably not passive. If they're learning, they're not passive. So this is one of those things that, you know, I thought this was a great title when I submitted this presentation. And, and as, I got, as, I, as I went through 
um, doing, getting, do, doing the preparation, thinking about what I was going to tell you, I realized this is really a lousy title. But it illustrates some of the biases that we have as instructors when it comes to looking at our learners and how they approach the learning task. And how is it that we might be more open to what the students bring of themselves to the classroom in the ways that they prefer to bring that. So, I teach LED 4150 assessment differentiation across the classroom. Where this class came from was, first of all, there's something called the Higher Education Opportunity Act that identifies five populations that we're required to teach our students to um, be able to deal with in uh, public school classrooms. Early childhood, English uh, second language learners, special education students. Um, did I say English language learners? I'm, I'm, I'm missing one. Um, reading, students who are struggling in their reading, and gifted and talented students. And that's how I got assigned this class is because I'm the gifted and talented person. So they said, well, Scott, even though there are five populations in the HEOA, since you do gifted, you go ahead and come up with this class. So this class goes beyond just working with gifted and talented students as far as differentiation and, 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 and how you work with students who, who bring different kinds of needs to the classroom. Well, if I'm teaching a class on differentiation, what would be one of my responsibilities in that particular class, do you think? Should I probably differentiate uh, the, the learning experience for the students in that class? Yes. We also had our student teaching exit data that indicated one of the things our students felt like they weren't being well prepared by an institution was on the use of assessment data and how to do assessment, how to do assessment, how to use assessment data to make instructional decisions about students. So this class specifically focuses on that. And then our student teacher ratings, the ratings by the cooperating teachers and the um, university supervisors itself showed that our students were somewhat weak on assessment. Now this is, this is a problem coming from an institution that is rated by, in, when we do our surveys of the superintendents across the state, 75% response rate, 67% of those indicate they'd rather have a graduate from Utah State University's teacher education program than any other teacher education program in the state of Utah. So if we're not doing the job in terms of preparing students for, for using assessment in instructional decisions, then you can imagine how, how much weaker others might, might be with that. The focus is UCAS, the Utah, uh, the Utah, oh, this is on one of my tests. You have to know what the UCAS means to pass this course. Um, the Utah Comprehensive Assessment System, UCAS. Um, so we, 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 we teach students how to interpret the SAGE's scores. It's probably the hardest thing we try to teach, but if any of you have kids or grandkids, Friends and neighbors in the schools, they take a SAGES test at the end, which is the, which is the end of level test, the criterion reference test to see what it is these kids know. We teach how to interpret those scores. The test generates two, two types of scores. One, a score related to proficiency, and then one is a scale score that it, that it generates. And we teach the students how to interpret those and how to interpret percentiles. Just on the phone this week with a district level person who didn't understand the difference between percentiles and percentages and so trying to explain that and, and, and I'm trying to get our students out to understand what's going on. One of my very favorite things is these students have to go out and interview their cooperating teachers and see what their cooperating teachers think of the SAGES test and how they use the scores. What often happens is my students end up giving a little mini workshop to their cooperating teacher about how to interpret the SAGES scores. Um, so that's one of the four focuses. Formative strategies, how it is you do formative assessment. It was mentioned today in our keynote about all the different kinds of ways of doing formative assessment. We teach students the different ways of doing that, all the way from how you um, look at people's faces and read people's faces to understand what's going on to more um, strategies that take more preparation, like the famous whiteboard strategy where the students write on a whiteboard and hold it up so that you can look around on all the whiteboards and see what students are doing. I've never actually seen anyone do that in higher education, but it's a lot of fun when you watch second graders doing it. And then finally, differentiation pathways. We try not to focus on specific 
um, strategies for differentiation in this course, even though we do spend some time teaching some, some specific beginning strategies. But it's more differentiation as a way of thinking about your classroom and approaching and what are the different pathways that you can use to be responsive to those students. So the grading in this class is standards based. There are 14 standards the students have to meet. All homework is for practice to get them ready for the assessment that says, yes, I have these skills or this knowledge. This is really hard for students to get used to. They're used to a point system where I accumulate points and exams are worth a certain amount, assignments are worth a certain amount, and attendance and participation is worth a certain amount. The term paper or term project is worth a certain amount. It's not the way this class operates. It is, you give me evidence that you know how to do these things or that you know these things, and then based on that evidence, we give a rating. There's a rubric, a five-point rubric that's used to indicate the level of evidence the student is getting in it. Just it really is confusing to students right at first. That, so the assignments, I don't have to do at all. I could just take the test and, and show that I know how to do this stuff. And in fact, the answer is yes. They take a pretest. Any objectives they show that they have the skills on on the pretest. They, are, they, are, they don't have to come to class when I do that particular lecture. They can do extra work on that day related to the topic that we're teaching, and uh, which we call extensions which I'll talk about more in a little, a little while, or they do exercises that get them ready to do the demonstration of what it is the um, objective addresses. Now, what we do tell them is the practice exercises actually do help you perform better on the test. So it is to your advantage to come to class and to do the practice exercises and so on, but it's, it's my grade is based on the test only. And I said, well, your grade is based on the assessment information that um, we have, the evidence that we have that you can in fact do these things. The test is two-thirds performance items and one-third objective items. It's the performance items that really tell us what's going on. Okay, so standards-based grading across three units. Then student choice. Students are given multiple choices about what it is, how it is they can approach the learning. First of all, we use the case method. Remember, try and make it real. This is my effort to make it real. So in this particular course, there are two classes of students. There is a second grade class and a fifth grade class. So the students can choose if they want to work with an upper grade, upper grade group or a, or a primary grade group. These are fictitious kids. It's simulation, but they've got student records on all of these kids that includes all the kinds of scores that they might ever see about these kids and then we teach them how to interpret those scores, how to use those scores to make instructional decisions about the different, different kinds of kids. So they get to choose in each unit whether they want to work with second graders or fifth graders. Then they can choose peer tutoring or not. The research on peer tutoring among children is that peer tutoring is actually one of the worst things that you can do with kids. Um, having kids work within their same grade level, putting a really high kid with a really low kid is, is an invitation for uh, inventing uh, resentment, primarily. The closer the kids are to one another, to one another, in their achievement levels at school in the peer tutoring dyad, the more they will benefit from the peer tutoring. So highs, tutor, peer, peer tutoring highs, mid, mid, middle kids, peer tutoring middle kids, low kids, peer tutoring low kids. And you might think, gee, that's going to be the blind leading the blind, but it turns out that the closer they are, the more often that they can then switch that peer tutor learner role What's one of the best ways to learn? It was, we saw it this morning. It's to teach. If I'm always putting a high kid with a low kid, when does the low kid ever get the opportunity to learn that way then? Never. If I put kids who are close together, then they get that opportunity from time to time. 
Well, in a college classroom, I've actually done this um, in my social studies education class where I gave some assessments and so on and put kids in peer tutoring groups where they, um, where, where based on that data, they had the, the mixed ability that is suggested by the cooperative learning. What I do now in this class is they have a choice to be uh, peer tutors. They can work in peer tutoring groups that they formulate on their own or they can choose to work by themselves and not be part of a study group. The class is structured so it's taught, on, it's taught on one day of week. We actually started out with this class being taught two days a week and it just didn't work as well. I'm so happy that we went to one day a week. So on Tuesday, the first half of the class is the lecture demonstration, presentation, exposition. The second half of the class is study hall where the students work on the exercises based on that standards-based grading that helps them get ready to perform the tasks and the teaching team, I circulate, I have TAs and UTFs that circulate and help students work on those particular assignments. The students are free then to work also in peer tutor teams if they choose to or by themselves. But that circulation as they're moving around that is, is important. So they've got that choice about how it is they get to learn. If they like to, like to work in teams, they get to work in teams. If not, they uh, are, can work by themselves. And then the active learning. They get and choose, and the, at, at the beginning of each unit, they send me an email and say, and all it has to say is, yes, I want to be an active learner. And I'll show you in just a second what the implications are of that. Now, just this morning, I'm, I've changed all this this morning based on what I've learned and the kind of comments that we just made here in criticizing my title. So um, I'll, I'll talk to you in a little bit about this whole act of learning. But the students are, are permitted to tell me I don't want to be called on in class. Okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a quiet student. Now, I used to call it then you're a passive learner, and I've got new terms for that that I'm going to play with today and see what you think. And then finally, the extension activities, and I already explained, if you pass off the pre, if you pass off the pre-test, then there are extension activities that are available for you to do to uh, extend your learning, to go deeper into, into the learning of the concept that is, that is um, part of that objective. Or you can voluntarily do these if you want to do additional activities in addition to the practice exercises. So, the active learner. Here are, the, here are the requirements for being a participating learner is now the new form uh, term that I've decided to try to use. I'm going to assume that everybody is active and I'm going to tell them all that they're active. But some are have told me, I, I'm going to participate. Well, what do you have to do to be a participating learner? You have to complete all required readings before class. You attend the entire class session each week and sign the role. You thoughtfully listen to presentations and take careful notes, and you're always on task in class when guided practice opportunities are given. That doesn't, there's nothing earth shattering about that. Right? Plus, you will participate in learning sessions by volunteering questions or comments during the presentation or by responding when randomly called upon by the instructor. Those of us in elementary education have hundreds of ways that we do random assignment. We do random calling on students. My favorite is called the index card discussion where every student's name is on an index card and I look at the top index card of my students who have said I will be a participating student and I call the student's name. And then I reshuffle it. I never put it on the bottom. I always reshuffle it. Because you put it on the bottom, what happens? Well, the student is signaled. Since my name is now going on the bottom of the index card pile, I'm free. I don't have to worry about being called. When I stick it in the middle, they don't know if I put it down three cards or two cards or seven cards or at the bottom. So they're not released from responsibility for, for participating in the class at that particular point. Or you can pull popsicle sticks with the student's names written on them. We like to do that. Or you can have a great big die that has the students' names on it and roll the die. You know, we, 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 we love doing all sorts of things to, to come up with random ways of, of knowing, of having students be, be called on. And then continue working aloud with the instructor 
in a coaching exchange to correct, clarify, or strengthen your questions, comments, or responses, or assist the, assist the instructor in correcting his or her instruction or information. So once you're called on, I stay with you until you have gone through whatever it is we're talking about. Now in reading, um, one of the things Rita talks about is letting students know, is this an oral quiz, which means there's a right answer and we're trying to get there, or is this a discussion item? And you have to let the students know which of those kind it is. I call it, guess what the professor has in mind, or let's have a discussion. Okay, and so I'll say, this is a guess what the professor has in mind question. And if you don't use the exact word or the kinds of things that, I've, that I have in mind, then I'll coach you through until we get there. When we're trying to interpret SAGE scores and student has a scale score of 452, you can imagine that we spend quite a bit of time with lots of student volunteers trying to explain what that score means. And there's usually a lot of public correction. Mistakes are honored as opportunities to learn. Okay. And then you'll notice one other thing here that I think is really, really important to let students know that sometimes as an instructor, I may have made an error in my instruction or information. And as we're working together publicly, you have the opportunity to say, but Dr. Hunsaker, you said in your lecture a little while ago, such and such, and now you're saying, this, help me figure these kinds of things out so that the interchange becomes, becomes an active one in which um, you're more equals trying to understand together what is, what is going on. Any questions so far about what the active, what, what now I'm calling the participating learner? Thank you. Thank you for asking. The question was, what percentage of my students sign up to be an active learner? During the first unit, about 33 to 40%. And I get a lot who will write me a note to say, I want to see what happens to active learners first. <laughs> OK? After that, it gets closer between that 50 to 60 to 75 percent range, depending on depending on the class. Once they see how the active learner gets treated, and it turns out that it's not, you know, it's 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 not a disaster. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I know in the interchange I make a student feel dumb, and a lot of that has to do with 16 years of education they've already had and how they feel about mistakes. Because I'll say, okay, we're just about there, but here's this mistake you made. And for some learners, that's, that, that, that makes them feel dumb publicly. But for most, they start getting to that whole idea that actually the fact that I made that mistake probably is helping other learners as we work through that mistake. So, so it increases. I, I, this, this class has three units. It increases as time goes on. Okay. And then you'll have some students who, who say, OK, I'm going to be an active learner during the, um, during the differentiation unit or during the formative assessment unit, but I don't want to be an active learner during the cumulative file unit when we're talking about those test scores. Okay, yes? Better, a better way of looking at it. And I'm certainly open to that kind of thing because, and, and let me show you one more slide and then I'm going to talk about a, a, a middle class that, that, I've, that I decided on this morning while I was driving in. So, and then also, the, the participating learner notifies the instructor through comments or questions in class or Canvas messages after class when you believe there are misunderstandings or concerns among your fellow students about course content, assignments, or procedures. I say, you're my spies. Okay? If you've overheard something from a student, 
Thank you. You've overheard something from a student who is saying, I don't get this. You know, I didn't explain it. And, and we didn't pick it up in study hall during the circulating or something like that. Someone's got to let me know. Now, of course, some of that we'll pick up also in the assignments as we grade the assignments that, um, and then give students feedback with an opportunity to then redo the assignment um, that is the practice assignment that moves them towards achievement of the objectives that we'll pick some of that up. But sometimes it's nice to say, um, you know, someone say, Dr. Hunsaker, people just aren't getting this, this, the, the, the use of the affective dimension in the pathways toward, dimension, to, toward differentiation, which is usually something that the students don't have a difficult time looking at. Okay. Now, notice what I call the observing learner. So I'm participating in observing learner. And I, you know, and I'm going to, I like this public versus private idea also. The observing learner completes all required readings, attends the entire class session, thoughtfully listens to presentations, and always, is always on task when guided practice opportunities. So I've gone between, I, I, I kind of split the participant observation term and said, okay, some of you are going to be participants, some of you are going to be observers, and, um, and, and so that's what I've come up with at this point. I, I find you know, this whole pr public-private thing kind of an interesting, intriguing idea. Now, in between these two, there's the participating one who's, who's public with their oral participation. I thought, you know, there's this middle group that would probably be willing to participate by sharing their notes. And so, in between participating and observing, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of establishing this sharing class and then giving a spot in Canvas, in the, in the Canvas discussion, where they can type up and post their notes so that others can, can, can use those, can look at them and say, oh, I didn't understand this this way and have some discussion about that as well. And, and so that the sharing also becomes one way of being active without, and being public without having to be public in, in class discussions. And that, that, that gives another kind of student a, a way to contribute to other students' learning. Yes? So, earlier we talked about how maybe being active in class is not a continuum. And to me, this kind of looks like it's dichotomous, where even though we're changing the words, we're still looking at it as students are passing and learning and absorbing 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 and Excellent, excellent question, and there, and, and there are a couple of things to try and address that. One is the students get to make a choice with each unit so they can change what role they want to play as each unit comes along. Okay, And they may start out saying, I'm going to be a participating one for this next unit. I think I feel more comfortable being just an observer, and then I'll go back to being a participating learner. The other is the introduction of that third level, that middle level that I've just talked about as the sharing, as being more of a recognition of that continuum than the dichotomous kind of thing. So that's, I mean, that's part of, part of uh, clearly I'm having these same kinds of thoughts, which is why I've come up with that third one, which is actually, I guess, the middle one now in, 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 in the stream to try and address that continuum idea. Uh, and, and still always giving students the choice of how they do it and being able to make that choice at least three times during the semester so that if you say, I am going to be an observing learner for the first unit, you're not stuck with that all semester. Then, it doesn't matter if you, the, the way this works is you get extension points. So it's not, it, it, it's not points that you get that is evidence that you've received the, um, that you have learned the objective, which is on a five point scale, but then there are tenths of points that are added into your score when you do extension assignments. Choosing to be um, observing, sharing, or participating has implications as far as the extension that you're doing. And even if you have signed up to say, I'm going to be an observing student, but raise your hand and volunteer during class anyway, which sometimes happens, you're going to get extension point credit for having taken that risk that particular day anyway. Okay. So the persons who volunteer 
to be participating learners get, get the extension point for the entire unit because they're willing to do that. And then the days they actually participate, they get an additional extension point. Any learner who participates gets an additional extension point on that day also. So that addresses that continuum also. That some days I just say, hey, I've, I've, I, you know, I'm feeling comfortable with this thing, or I have a question, and I feel, I'm feeling safer now about asking that question. So that's it. I'm done. A part participating round of applause. <laughs>